read in the Gospel of Matthew that the mother of James and John came to Jesus with a special request. This happened just days prior to Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. By this time, many multitudes were excitedly following Jesus as he headed toward Jerusalem. No doubt many of them were anticipating that this was the time that Jesus would be gloriously heralded and recognized as Israel's true King, the Messiah, who would then deliver Israel from its oppression and establish God's kingdom on earth. They hadn't yet fully understood that Jesus had come to suffer, not only for Israel's sins, but for the sins of the whole world. There's something highly ironic then about the timing of James and John's mother's request. She would love, of course, for her two sons to have this place of utmost honor sitting beside Jesus, enthroned in his kingdom, one son on one side and the other on the other side. Little does mom realize that this is the very hour that Jesus is about to be rejected, betrayed, and crucified. She shows the utmost respect toward Jesus. She humbly kneels down, uh, showing him great honor. She requests this favor of him, but Jesus ultimately disappoints her with his answer. He tells mom, you don't fully realize what it is you're asking. And this is so true. Naturally, mom wants the very best for her two boys. After all, they've given up everything to follow Jesus. Why shouldn't they then be justly rewarded for their noble sacrifice with this reward of sitting on the right and left hand of King Jesus? Now, the other disciples, no doubt, they've also given up everything to follow Jesus, so why should James and John only have this special privilege? Why do they get this place of honor instead of themselves? Therefore, the other disciples are highly indignant. They're highly offended. Notice how Jesus doesn't immediately deny James and John's mother's request. He first questions the brothers. Are you able to drink of the cup that I'm about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I'm about to experience? And not really realizing what Jesus is saying, both brothers automatically nod yes. After all, they implicitly trust Jesus, or so they assume. But Jesus is absolutely correct, of course. They don't really know what they're asking. In the end, who is it that takes this position of supposed honor on Jesus' right hand and his left? Well, it's none other than these two thieves that are crucified on his left and right. Initially, both thieves blaspheme Jesus, but eventually one of them repents and he becomes a believer, most likely after he hears Jesus graciously forgive his detractors. Now, James and John really have no idea what they're asking. We can't really blame them, actually. We too are susceptible of the same kind of human inclination to seek things for ourselves, at least what we perceive to be to our advantage. And of course, to occupy the position of honor on Jesus' right and left is definitely the greatest advantage, or so we assume. But notice how Jesus takes the low seat. Jesus humbles himself. Jesus refers to the cross as the hour of his glory. Do we realize this? Do we realize what it really means to believe in Jesus, to follow Jesus, to love Jesus, to esteem Jesus? Jesus goes on to inform these two brothers, actually, you will indeed drink my cup and you will indeed be baptized with the same baptism. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not up to me to decide. That is my father's ultimate decision. He's already prepared that place of honor for someone. So when the other disciples hear this, they're greatly indignant. They too probably would want to enjoy some position of honor, privilege, something that they want. But they too completely misunderstand Jesus' meaning. Therefore, Jesus called all of his disciples together and he taught them. He explained, you all know how the rulers of the Gentiles enjoy lording it over other people. They love the positions of honor and prestige. They enjoy having others envy them and look up to them. They like wielding power over other human beings. But it shall not be so among you. Instead, whoever among you desires to be great must become the servant of all. Notice how Jesus doesn't advocate flat leadership in the kingdom of God. To the contrary, Jesus tells his own disciples, 
If you seek greatness in my kingdom, that is indeed something noble, but here's how to go about it. In other words, there is greatness in the kingdom of God, but it's not exactly what we might imagine. Greatness in Christ's kingdom is serving. Greatness is humility. Greatness is love. Greatness is caring about others. Greatness is not about being self-focused. It's about being others-focused. This is the greatness of Jesus. Jesus tells them, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and came to give his life a ransom for many. Can we learn from Jesus how to think, how to value, and how to live this way? What does it really mean to be close to Jesus? Closeness to Jesus is not mere image or mere appearance. It's much more than that. It's more than proximity. After all, Judas was one of the 12. He too occupied a privileged seat of honor at the table with Jesus. Yet, in the end, he betrayed Jesus. No, to be close to Jesus is to learn from him, to learn how to share his heart, his values, his motives, his priorities, his desires. In this regard, we can all be actually as close to Jesus as we truly desire. So I guess the question is, how close do you and I desire to be to Jesus? Join me in prayer. Lord, as we think about Jesus and his teaching prior to the cross, ironically, as he's going to the cross, and yet we see his own disciples who had lived and walked with him for three years, still not quite fully understanding. And we too can relate to this because we all naturally, we all naturally seek good things. We, we want benefits and that itself is not wrong. And your word says, forget not the Lord's benefits. And salvation is a benefit. Forgiveness is a benefit. Healing and blessing, these are benefits. But the goal is to know you. And to really know you, we need to learn from you. We need to see who you are, what you're doing, where you're going. So that in following you, we're not just merely experiencing proximity to you, but we are experiencing true intimacy which is this conformity into your very image. And we need your grace to do that. So Lord, would you reveal to our hearts, to our minds, to our wills, exactly who you are, so that we can learn from you. And we too, like Jesus, can take that low seat. We can too also learn what greatness really is in your kingdom. And so give glory to you. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.